Okay, live is open. Sergeants, will you begin your recordings? Computer is up. Cloud is rolling. Pack up is rolling. Thank you. Sergeant Belando, you may start the opening. Good morning and welcome to today's remote New York City Council FY22 preliminary budget hearing for the Committee on Public Safety. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their video for verification purposes? Once again, would all panelists please turn on their video for verification purposes? To minimize disruptions, please place all electronic devices to vibrate or silent mode. If you'd like to submit testimony, please send via email to testimony at council.myc.gov. Again, that is testimony at council.myc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. Chair Adams, we are ready to begin. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining today's virtual hearing. I'm Councilmember Adrian Adams, Chair of the Committee on Public Safety. I'd like to acknowledge that we have been joined today by I see Council Members Holden, Council Member Riley, Council Member Brannon, and I'm sure that other colleagues will be joining shortly. Welcome to day two of the public safety hearing to discuss the fiscal 2022 preliminary budget. Today, we will close out our committee's budget hearing with the city's district attorneys. The fiscal 2022 preliminary plan did not include major changes for our five district attorneys and special narcotics prosecutors fiscal 2020 budget of $458.3 million. However, state and federal grant funding has increased the total current budget in fiscal 2021 to $477.5 million. The city supports the majority of the prosecutor's budget with 446 million coming from the city and state and federal funds accounting for $12.3 million. The advance, as the new chair of public safety, it's my honor to thank you for over 10 years of service as district attorney of Manhattan. You've shown thoughtful leadership in the way our city practices criminal justice and have spearheaded numerous reforms and meaningful changes to prosecution throughout your tenure. This has included ending criminal prosecution of thousands of low-level, nonviolent offenses and crimes related to poverty. Additionally, your investments in diversion programs like supervised release and over $250 million back into the community through your office's criminal justice investment initiative has touched hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers, including many young people. Your successor certainly has big shoes to fill. VA Cat, my friend, I am also so excited to hear from you about your strategic plan for your office and the vision you have for serving the people of Queens, our constituents of Queens, especially given that I represent the 28th Council District in the communities of Jamaica, Richmond Hill, Rochdale Village, and South Ozone Park. Your predecessor held office for nearly 30 years, one of the longest tenures of any DA in New York City. And I look forward to learning about what changes you intend to introduce and the new programs, bureaus, and units you have launched since taking office last year. In the last two years, we've seen a fundamental shift in the role of prosecutors in our communities, promoting criminal justice reform efforts and diverting people from incarceration or involvement in the justice system around the city. Many of the DA's initiatives and various bureaus and units are those that this council fought for, including a conviction integrity review unit in Staten Island and diversion programs like HOPE, CLEAR, RESET, ATI units, and immigration collateral consequences units. The council is concerned that some of these programs previously funded by the administration are not included in the current fiscal 2021 budget and are not yet included in the fiscal 2022 budget. We look forward to hearing from all of your offices on how these programs are impacting the communities you all work in and how this lack of funding has impacted your ability to do that work. Although COVID-19 may have lessened the impact of discovery reform for now, I also look forward to learning more about the funding concerns 
related to full implementation, as well as any other budget requests your offices may have. Before we get started though, I would like to thank our Public Safety Committee staff for the work they've done to prepare for this important hearing. Our financial analyst, Monty Papel, Unit Head Isha Wright, Deputy Director Regina Pareda Ryan, and Finance Director Latanya McKinney. I also want to thank Council Don Addis and Max Kempfer Williams, and our policy analysts, Aliyah Reynolds and Matthew Thompson. For my staff, I'd like to thank my Chief of Staff, Jamal Wilkerson, Budget Director Kate Mooney, and Legislative Director Benjamin Fang. Okay. We are uh, also joined by Council Members Rosenthal, Rodriguez, Holden, and Riley. Uh, I will now turn it back over to our moderator, Committee Council Daniel Addis, to go over some procedural items. Thank you, Chair. I am Daniel Addis, Council for the Committee on Public Safety of the New York City Council. Before we begin testimony, I want to remind everyone uh, that you will be muted until you're called on to testify, at which point you will be unmuted by the host. I will be calling on panelists to testify. During the Q&A portion of the hearing, we will unmute all of the district attorneys and the special narcotics prosecutor. Please do not mute yourselves so that you're available to respond to questions. If council members would like to ask a question of the, of, uh, the district attorneys or the special narcotics prosecutor or a specific panelist, uh, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in that order. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes, which includes the time it takes to answer questions. All hearing participants should submit written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov if you have not already done so. Members of the public may also submit their written testimony. The deadline for written testimony is 72 hours after the hearing. Now to the five district attorneys and the special narcotics prosecutor, I will first call on each of you in turn to administer the oath, then again when it is time to begin your testimony in the same order. I will now read the oath and ask each of you to affirm. Uh, please raise your right hands. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Uh, Queens County District Attorney Melinda Katz. I do. Kings County District Attorney Eric Gonzalez. I do. Uh, Richmond County District Attorney Michael McMahon. I do. Bronx County District Attorney Darcel Clark. I do. New York County District Attorney Cyrus Vance. I do. And the Special Narcotics Pre Prosecutor Bridget Brennan. I do. Thank you. Uh, now I invite uh, Queens District Attorney Melinda Katz to testify. I apologize. I thought we might be going in order of seniority, but uh, happy to testify. Uh, first, thank you, Chair Adams. Thank you to the New York City Council uh, for having this testimony today. Uh, I do want to acknowledge uh, other people from my office that are on this call. So in case the questions uh, are those that they can answer and help with. We have first Chief Assistant Jennifer Nyberg is on this call. Uh, Chief of Staff, many of you are very familiar with her. Camille Chinkifat uh, is on the call. Uh, Jackie Duckfield from my finance and Kristen Kane, uh, who chairs uh, legislative affairs here um, at the Queens District Attorney's Office, happy to testify on the 2022 preliminary budget. You know, 2020 was like no other year. Uh, no one could have anticipated the incredible challenges uh, that this year would bring. With the economic and emotional impact of the pandemic still taking its tolls in so many of our communities and throughout the world. But despite these unprecedented difficulties, we were able to achieve so much. And many of you know that this is my, I guess, 15th month uh, as the district attorney and many changes were made uh, in the first year. New policies are ensuring that all low-level arrests are closely evaluated. I've declined to prosecute for fair evasion, low-level marijuana, protesters failing to wear masks, uh, as these offenses often disproportionately affect lower income residents and also communities of color. Transitioning towards ending cash bail in Queens has not been easy. I firmly believe that a person's financial situation should not determine whether or not they're held in jail. I find that the resources are limited when it comes to bail, uh, but we are working towards not-for-profits starting to be involved in it. Increasing the rate at which felony cases charging adolescent offenders are removed to family court here in Queens County 
uh, making more equitable parole recommendations and taking into account a defendant's efforts at rehabilitation. And on day one, ending the unfair practice of requiring defendants to waive their rights and allowing defendants to engage in plea negotiations at any stage of the process. Utilizing diversion and alternative sentencing much more, placing a strong emphasis on these programs. We also raised the level of professionalism in this office by enhancing training at all levels of government, at all levels in our office, mandating ADAs attending local community events in addition to the strict training that they are now uh, over performing. Uh, increasing transparency by broadening categories of information where we disclose in FOIL requests. Even through a worldwide pandemic, even through going virtual, coming back, going virtual again, coming back again, we have restructured quite a bit of this office. One of the first priorities was the creation of the Conviction Integrity Unit to ensure that no one's been wrongfully convicted of a crime and also admitting the fact that the system can make mistakes. Uh, and we wanted to go through a lot of the uh, cases. There's almost about 100 in our Conviction Integrity Unit now. I created the new rehabilitation program and restorative services bureau to ensure that while we keep Queens safe, we administer justice with compassion and with equity. I also enhanced the community partnerships division where we open the doors to my office. We strengthen ties to our communities. We have ADAs or people going out to community meetings. We established a domestic violence helpline. We saw that domestic violence was being underreported during COVID and we just, established a hotline, help which was 24 seven, either to connect someone to services or to connect them to an ADA. We also, in very meaningful addition to this office, hired an immigration lawyer. That immigration lawyer has been key in repleting cases that are 20, 30 years old, that had uh, immigration uh, consequences and making sure that there was a path for someone to have their cases repled, to make sure that they can stay in the country um, and that the deportation consequences uh, were, um, were rethought. Uh, and the immigration lawyer is involved in almost every case when immigration uh, may be an issue. Last year, we had $75.4 million as a baseline budget in FY20. We did give back some money, but that's because uh, I was only here uh, for a half a year at that point. Uh, we were able to do this just because of that. This year, we find that the budget is very um, minimal for us. Uh, we're trying our best with all of these new programs, with all of the reform that we've done uh, to be able to stay uh, within those budgets. Um, but we do things here like addressing guns, gangs, and drugs and a new violent criminal enterprise bureau, a community partnership division, a crime strategies unit. We focus on major economic crimes, holding employers and companies accountable for their behavior. We combat domestic violence with a uh, CONSTAT uh, type uh, of program in domestic violence to make sure that people have someone here that they can be with and get them out of the situations they're in. Whether, by the way, whether they decide to prosecute or not, we are here for them. And we follow them through the system and help in any way they want. But our main thing is to restore confidence in the system. Um, to better serve our community, like I said, we work on the immigrant community with the immigrant community, creating the position of the immigrant specialist. But we've also started bureaus like housing and worker protection, so that if an employer is taking advantage of an employee because of their documentation status or because of anything else, that we are there in order to make sure that they have someone to protect without um, without any uh, consequences. Um, because of their staff status. We have a lot of new needs and I'm, I'm not gonna go through all of them, but you know, I've been here 14 months. I've restructured an entire office. I have uh, made sure that the last 28 years were reviewed for fairness and for equity. We have office needs, we have space needs. We cannot continue um, with a lot of the new programs, a lot of the new bureaus, a lot of the new divisions unless we look at new needs um, for this office. And those new needs include things that, you know, like anti-gun, buying guns from off the street, uh, conviction integrity unit, 
our Violent Criminal Enterprise Bureau, our domestic violence. And by the way, the criminal justice reform money that was given by the council, uh, I guess a year and a half ago or so, this office uh, has utilized uh, all it's gotten pretty much uh, for this year uh, and all it had for last year. And as we all know, it originally was supposed to be twice as much. Um, and so to the city council, I know you have tough decisions to make, I get it. I, I've been there. I've sat in the seat that you are sitting now, trying to determine how to accommodate and disseminate the limited amount of funds we have. But to add all of the criminal justice reform movement that we are doing, to continue to prosecute drivers of crime, it is important that our budget indicates and is there for us as well. So thank you to the council for your uh, listening to us and for holding this hearing. I look forward to answering questions to my colleagues. Looking forward to hearing from you as well. Thank you. We will now turn to Kings, uh, Kings County District Attorney Eric Gonzalez. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good afternoon to my fellow colleagues. Uh, thank you to Chairperson Adrian Adams and the entire committee for the opportunity to address you today regarding the mayor's fiscal 2022 uh, January budget plan. These remain difficult times for our city. I remain steadfast in my commitment to reforms of our criminal justice system that address the inequities that have been laid so bare during this pandemic. I know we can keep our public safe while also ensuring fundamental fairness in our justice system. I'm glad to be back before the council to discuss our current budget, the ways in which we've attempted to address the crisis and the ongoing budgetary needs of our office. Just over a year ago when this pandemic began, I committed that my priority would be the health and safety of my entire staff. We are among the first agencies in the city to shift to remote working with only a skeletal crew coming in each and every day. Previously, we had no work for home program or capacity. While this adjustment had many challenges, our team was committed to continuing the work of keeping the people of Brooklyn safe. As you are aware, our level of operation is highly dependent on that of the courts. And the courts um, in March of last year closed down in, in most regards. We remain in close contact with the courts to ensure that we have sufficient staff as the courts resume in-person operations. And the chief judge has informed us that jury trials will uh, resume soon. Uh, we will make sure that we continue to prioritize the health of everyone involved in the administration of justice in this county and continue to meet the needs of our, our court system. But with all that's happened, it's very easy to lose um, sight of the fact that even before COVID, 2020 was going to be a year of unprecedented change and challenges to the criminal justice system. The state the legislature enacted sweeping new criminal procedure laws affecting both bail and most notably discovery. Given our longstanding custom in Brooklyn of early and broad, uh, discovery, the expansion of discoverable materials was less of an ideological shift to us than maybe in some other counties. But its time limits, however, requiring the production of all material within 15 days of arraignment were new to everyone and posed unique challenges in a jurisdiction like ours charging tens of thousands of cases a year. As you well know, the legislature's mandate was unfunded. Thankfully, the city recognized the unique demands created by this situation and allocated additional funds to my office for both new staff and OTPS expenditures to scale up our operations and to meet the new requirements of the law. In March, when we should have been assessing the early results of both the new requirements and our efforts to meet them, our court system was largely shut down because of COVID. <clears throat> Instead of reassessing our needs and realigning the resources, we were caught in the situation of having to create virtual operations for our staff virtually overnight and in securing enough equipment, laptops and other materials so that our staff could do and work virtually from home. 
the effect of the shutdown on our criminal justice system has been an unavoidable backlog. Thousands of felony indictments are waiting to be tried. Thousands of felony complaints are waiting to be heard by grand juries. And thousands of misdemeanor cases are left unresolved. This situation is much worse than anything that this office has experienced during the 9-11 crisis or even Superstorm Sandy. It's not clear yet what the effects of this backlog will be into the administration of justice. But to be clear, this is the biggest change in our criminal justice system in my over 25 years as a prosecutor, magnified exponentially by a once in a century pandemic. The backlog alone leaves us facing challenges that no criminal justice system has faced in this city's history. We remain in urgent need of additional resources pledged by the administration consisting of $4.1 million to ensure we can meet our statutory obligations and secure just resolutions to thousands of serious matters. We have been helpless to stop so much of the damage that's been caused by the pandemic, but with the right resources and the will to do so, we can prevent the pandemic from causing additional damage to our justice system and our communities. My staff and I have the will but we need the city to provide the tools and resources. As part of the criminal justice reform funding provided by the city and unrelated to COVID, $8.4 million in capital funding was committed to allow us to complete several essential IT projects. The pandemic, the backlog of cases has put even a greater strain on already a fragile technology infrastructure in this office. Our data network system is over a decade old. It was antiquated even before the pandemic began, but we have now put additional strains on that system with remote work and virtual court appearances and many of the other things we need to do in order to do our jobs. We cannot risk its failure, its collapse. It, the work is too important and these systems are too critical to the administration of justice. We can't have any further delays. So we're ready to move forward with these critical upgrades to our system to ensure the continuity of criminal justice operations. And we're asking OMB to approve these projects to start as soon as possible. Hopefully the fiscal position of the office and of the city has been uh, enhanced with the federal recovery package and state aid to local governments but no part of our lives have gone untouched by the pandemic. We have lost people we care about in this city, in this county, in this office. Our friends and neighbors are out of work. Many are food insecure. And we know that in times of difficulty in our city, it's more critical than ever that we remain committed to crime prevention and early intervention. And last year's surge in shootings in this city reminds us that our work is never done. From 2016 to 2019, when I was serving as district attorney, I was able to come before the city council and tell you that Brooklyn was leading the way in the city in reduction of violent crime. Shootings had been at an all time low in 2019 and our homicides had been at an all time low in 2018. Unfortunately, I can't come before you today and tell you that. In 2020, Brooklyn led all boroughs in the number of shooting incidents by a significant amount. Over 40% of citywide shooting incidents occurred in Kings County. This is not the time for us to take our eye off the ball of violent crime. I remain committed to addressing the issue of increased shootings to ensure that the people of Brooklyn are actually safe. And it's very important now that we have adequate funding levels. During this time of health crisis, both the city and state have experienced a serious financial crisis. We understand that. Our office has managed the threat of looming cuts from the city during each budget plan, along with the uncertainty of grant funding that helps support most of our diversion programs uh, that Chair, Chairwoman Adams had mentioned and our youth programming. Our largest grant, State Aid to Prosecution, which is $2.1 million uh, and supports the salary of over 20 experienced senior assistant district attorneys prosecuting our most serious cases has not been renewed as of yet. 
Such a loss in staffing would simply jeopardize our ability to secure justice and safety in this county. We're asking for your support and advocacy with the state to maintain this crucial funding at the current level. While I focused on our COVID response and the need created by the pandemic, I want to make sure that in this hearing, we don't lose sight of the fact that our constituency are demanding reforms to our criminal justice system. I have been implementing reforms since day one. And for the past four years through my Justice 2020 initiative, I have made sure that our system becomes fairer. I have two specific requests for funding for programs that will help prevent the over-criminalization of people in our justice system. First, I'm gonna ask for your support for Project Reset, a pre-arraignment diversion program. Until this fall, we were able to facilitate meaningful interventions for participants, reducing the number of in-person arraignments during the public health crisis. The program is not currently funded in Brooklyn, and I would ask that the city council do everything in its power to fund that program. This program allows us to take thousands of people and avoid criminalization of their cases. I would also ask the city um, and the city council to take a look at funding the Brooklyn Young Adult Club. You've previously supported that. It's very important that we treat our young people in our criminal justice system in ways that do not lead to over-criminalization. Our young adult court is a remarkable place. I invite you to come see it, where 97% of our young people in that court leave without a criminal conviction. I also wanna thank all of you for your continued support for some of the most funding for some of the most uh, funding for some of the programs that serve our most vulnerable populations. In particular, our BRAVE program, which is a Broken Rising Against Violence program, our DOVE program, which is our domestic violence uh, funding program. Uh, these are critical programs that the city council has funded year after year to make sure that the most vulnerable among us have the services they need to feel safe and to make sure that they, see, they get justice. So I wanna thank all of you again for hearing me out on this. Um, I'm committed to public safety, but I believe we can do that while also increasing uh, fairness to our justice system. I will ask for the council support as we make the case to OMB for the critical funding that I discussed today. And I look forward as always to working as a partner with the city council as we improve the, the conditions that our communities live in in, in the city. Thank you. Thank you. We will now turn to Richmond County District Attorney Michael McMahon. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chairwoman, uh, Councilmember uh, Adams, uh, it is indeed a, uh, an honor and pleasure to uh, appear before you today. Uh, at this hearing and as the uh, council reconstituted uh, itself and brought the uh, district attorneys uh, ba uh, back under your jurisdiction in the public safety committee, uh, please know that uh, myself and my office look forward to working with you uh, and your staff. I wanna thank the members, uh, the other members of the committee. I know we're also joined by council members, Brannon, Riley, Rosenthal and Rodriguez. Uh, and of course I wanna thank uh, the members of the Staten Island Council delegation, Council Members Rose, uh, Matteo, and Borelli for their continued support uh, of our office and the work uh, that we do here. Um, since this is the first time that we are sort of meeting formally, um, part, it's not part of my testimony, but uh, I'm now in my sixth year uh, in office here in Richmond County, uh, and just want to be sure to make you aware uh, that many of the criminal justice reforms that were spoken about by my predecessors in one way, shape, uh, form or, or another, uh, we have implemented here in Staten Island as well over the last six years. And much of that is with the help and advocacy of the city council and, and of course the administration. We have uh, created a, a freestanding domestic violence bureau, catalyzed the opening of the family justice center, created a victim advocates unit and a special victims unit all to deal with the ongoing crisis we see in domestic violence and related issues. Uh, we reconnected this office with the community, with a community partnership unit, immigration affairs unit, and collateral consequences unit. Uh, we established programs in the community for our youth, a, a youth advisory council. Uh, we worked with the community with the hate crimes task force 
Um, and those are just a few of the things that we've done. Uh, in addition to establishing a uh, conviction integrity review unit, which I'd like to come back and talk to you about again, uh, all uh, and doing things like uh, clean slate to remove uh, summonses and gun buybacks, all of the sort of progressive yet everyday um, uh, issues that my colleagues have uh, taken on, we needed to take on in Staten Island as well. Uh, and I really am, am proud to say that we've turned this office or transformed this office into a modern prosecutor's office. And we, we fight every day to make the criminal justice system here in Staten Island stronger, fairer, and more just. And so what, and what I'd like to do is then uh, sort of go back to the outline, the uh, testimony that we've submitted to the committee today. Uh, and of course, as my colleagues have said, we've all dealt with the most remarkable year uh, of all years, uh, this, the COVID year, uh, and, and we've done it in a way, in a fashion that I'm very proud of my staff and my team here, uh, because as, as uh, Eric pointed out, the courts were shut down uh, to a large extent, yet our office remained open. Uh, my staff was here as, as needed. The, the leaders of this office have been here every day, as have I, uh, making sure that the criminal justice system functions uh, as much as possible under these dire uh, conditions. Uh, and today is a, re a very important day, I think, for all of us. I know here in Richmond County is the first day that jurors have been brought back to, so that we can commence trials. Uh, we've been doing grand juries uh, since uh, January. We had a little break in November and December. We've been doing them before that since August. Uh, and so we've been functioning as much as possible. Uh, and that's something that in indeed we are very proud of, proud of our partnership uh, with the courts and, and, and with the defense bar as well in doing that. So what I'd like to do is focus my testimony uh, this afternoon on three topics, the state of public safety here on Staten Island, uh, our continued efforts to address racial equity and build bridges and law enforcement in the, law enforcement and the community, and our dire fiscal outlook and priority budget needs uh, for fiscal year 2022. In many ways, Staten Island's uh, statistics uh, on crime over the last year are a microcosm of the city of New York. Um, the crime rate ha has remained relatively constant with a slight 0.3% uh, increase in index crimes overall. However, there were some very disturbing trends which my colleagues have already touched on, which have affected uh, Staten Island as well. Uh, these are in the areas of homicides and non-fatal shootings um, and um, uh, grand larcenies, grand larceny autos, uh, and uh, scams, if you will, uh, or, or crimes where people are duped into um, turning their money over to uh, a fraudulent enterprises. I do want to say, though, that while we've seen an uptick uh, in violence here in Staten Island, like the rest of the city, Staten Island, with a community of 500,000 people, uh, or a community that size, still remains the safest uh, community uh, in the United States. And that is, again, uh, thanks to our community partners, our partners in the New York City Police Department, and the people who work in this office and whom I'm very proud of. So let me just address homicides and non-fatal shootings. There was indeed a dramatic increase in 2020 as compared to 2018 and 2019. And as uh, DA Gonzalez pointed out, 2018 and 2019 were in the city uh, really uh, banner years, if you will, in bringing down the, the rates of, of homicides. They were very, very uh, successful years. Uh, so using them as a, as a metric sometimes uh, muddies the statistics. However, uh, we have to say that in Staten Island in 2019, we had 14 victims of a homicide. Uh, and in 2020, there were 21 victims. So that's a 50% increase uh, and that compares to a 42.9% increase uh, citywide. Sadly, this year, there have already been four homicides uh, on Staten Island. And when it comes to non-fatal shootings, uh, in 2019, we had 19 victims of non-fatal shootings. And in 2020, there were 31, a 63% increase. And that's compared to 103% increase citywide. And, so there are, and sadly, there have already been five non-fatal shootings on Staten Island this year. Now, I know that uh, my office, as well as my colleagues, we've been working with the police department. We wonder why we see this increase in violence. And we've asked ourselves uh, this question and we've done some uh, deep analysis here in our office and also working uh, with the members of our community. 
And we all know that the effects of, of COVID are palatable, uh, palpable, that people have lost jobs, the, uh, the economy is weakened, the, the city appears to be in crisis, both physically and emotionally. Um, and uh, the closing of schools, the ending of after school programs are all things that have contributed to that, as well as the ease and accessibility uh, to guns still on the streets in New York City. Uh, and so we've done a lot uh, to address this. We've convened uh, meetings with uh, our partners in, the, in Staten Island to uh, evaluate the situation, to look at different neighborhoods, to come up with neighborhood action plans, to understand the, the communities that continue to see the spikes uh, that we see now, as, as well also the communities that had uh, the, the high rate of gun violence in the 70s and 80s. And unfortunately, they're very much the same communities. And we see conditions, schools that don't rate as well as other schools, a very high unemployment, a lack of after school programs, a lack of, 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 of food availability, lack of health care. And so we are working together with our partners to address these issues to come up with long term uh, solutions. And I, I can say that in 2021, curbing uh, the violence on our streets will be the number one priority. Uh, of this office. Now, uh, as you know, uh, or I'd like to talk about also is the opioid epidemic and the surge in overdoses. When I came into office in 2016, uh, we were confronted with a major increase in heroin, in particular opioid uh, overdoses. Uh, and uh, we did a lot of work on it as well did, did our partners across the city of New York. Uh, and we saw in 2019, uh, there were 92 reported overdoses. This was a 17% decline from the year before and about a 20% uh, decline since 2016. Unfortunately, in the first half of 2020, the Department of Health uh, and Mental Health has reported that, that those six months reported the highest rate of overdose death uh, in the city of New York ever. Um, and, and I see my colleague, Darcel Clark, shaking her head because I know that Bronx uh, leads in this category, Staten Island is second. Um, and I know the other boroughs and my colleagues uh, are confronted with this issue as well. Um, and I, I, I just want the council to be aware that this problem continues to loom. Uh, and we think uh, it is um, only getting worse. And when you think of the mental health uh, consequences, the loneliness of COVID and how that feeds into the opioid epidemic um, and those who suffer from addiction, illness and mental health, uh, illness, uh, we are. We believe that we are going to see a much worse condition, and I say that because um, our numbers for all of last year show that they're about on par uh, with the year before in the low 90s. Um, but we don't, uh, because through our overdose response initiative, we capture real time most of the overdoses that occur. But we think that we're not uh, getting as many as we used to, and we expect the official numbers to come in uh, much higher. Um, and those are only the fatal uh, overdoses. The, the non-fatal overdoses are usually double uh, to three times uh, as much. We continue uh, our, oh, I have to also mentioned fentanyl. And, and I know that uh, Bridget Brennan will speak to this as well, but the increase in fentanyl is one of the prime reasons for the increase in the fatalities, uh, the fatal nature of the drugs that are being taken. Um, and we are now seeing fentanyl not only mixed in with uh, heroin, but also uh, with other drugs, cocaine and, and crystal meth uh, and encapsulated form. And, and this is a, a, an issue that we have called on the state legislature to address in ter terms of the controlled substances schedule, uh, because there are different fentanyl analogs uh, that are finding their way onto the market. Uh, but we also want the council to be aware that this is an issue uh, that we think um, is just starting to uh, rear its ugly head, if you will, again, uh, and um, we have to deal with it. And we need your help, and we look forward to your partnership uh, in doing that. We do have the ORI program as we investigate every overdose. We have the HOPE program, which is the pre-diversion uh, offer of uh, a resource and recovery center and uh, treatment that uh, ends up in, in a dismissal of a case. Uh, we have the HOPE court, the OR court, um, and we started a new program called Ripples of Hope, uh, which looks at the impact of uh, overdoses, drug activity, uh, uh, potentially uh, arrests uh, on the rest of the family, the members of the family and the community, 
uh, and with the federal grant, we are now con connecting those people with um, services at the YMCA to deal with sort of, if you will, the, the rippling effect of the uh, overdose, uh, the uh, addiction illness crisis. Uh, and we do that with the YMCA. We're also seeing, I regret to say, a, a very strong increase in suicides. Uh, and we all know uh, that the mental health crisis uh, in our city uh, is only worsening. And I think when we're through the COVID uh, crisis itself, we will see the impacts of that. Uh, and so we are starting to work with uh, the police department to uh, index uh, each suicide, a suicide attempt, and to see how we can intervene uh, with uh, a peer mentor type of approach uh, like we do with the uh, overdose cases. Um, we're also see uh, one of the numbers that is very troubling in Staten Island and I know the rest of the city is the grand larceny auto numbers, the GLAs. Um, they were up 66% in 2020 in Staten Island, uh, oh no, 66% uh, citywide and 37% uh, in Staten Island. Um, just a, a public service announcement here, 40% uh, of the GLAs, people left their keys in the car and 14%, they left their cars running. Uh, so I would urge the members of the city council in your, in your uh, newsletters and bulletins and when you speak to members of the community, please remind them in partnership with the police department that they should not leave their keys in the car and they should not leave their keys running. Seems obvious to us, uh, but um, it's happening in a, in a, in a wide, uh, very wide increase. We are also seeing um, crews that are coming over from New Jersey uh, to steal cars here and take them back to New Jersey. Uh, but uh, that's an issue that we're working on with the police department. Um, scams. Uh, I know that uh, my colleagues are seeing in their counties as well. Uh, every day, the number of reports of complaints that come in from individuals who are scammed out of their hard, uh, their, their life, uh, hard earned uh, earnings, if you will, their life's earnings, their life savings um, is tragic, uh, whether it's uh, social security scams, uh, romance scams, uh, uh, Department of Labor, unemployment uh, scams, uh, whether it's uh, scams about a family member who's in trouble and needs money, uh, whether it's Craigslist, whatever it is, it's a, it's a very big issue uh, that I'm sure that is affecting all of your constituents. And again, I would urge you to uh, take up some public service uh, announcements uh, with the police department to uh, prevent that. Um, before, before I get to funding, I just want to point out that uh, we continue to work here in Staten Island uh, for, on the issue of racial equity, the healing and creating a fair justice system uh, for all. Uh, we, the, the death of George Floyd obviously was a, a, a motivating factor for us to renew our efforts uh, in this uh, regard. Uh, and here in my office, we've created an internal working group. Uh, we've done community convenings. Uh, we've led uh, uh, courageous conversations and racial he uh, healing groups. We've done implicit bias training. Uh, and we've done a lot of community partnership efforts with the Hate Crimes Task Force and the Youth Advisory Council. So that's something we continue to focus on. Now, if I could, uh, just uh, I would like to address some of the budget issues that face us all. Um, and uh, to be honest, Madam Chairwoman, and I know that uh, Monica Peoples is on this uh, call, uh, someone who's worked with us in budgets in the past. Um, if we don't correct the situation that was created by the funding we received to implement the criminal justice reforms that the legislature passed, uh, but which only provided us with a little over a half a year's funding uh, if we don't correct that, then all, all of our agencies are going to face a situation where we're going to have to do layoffs, uh, stop providing the, 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 the sort of uh, thoughtful, uh, progressive uh, reforms that we've implemented, and we'll be unable to, uh, to do or perform our very basic functions uh, of prosecuting cases uh, pursuant to the law, providing discovery, um, and, and, and helping uh, the victims of crime. Uh, and protecting the constitutional rights of those who are accused of crime. Uh, we received in Staten Island, and I know this is just uh, reflective of the other uh, counties as well, um, funding for about 60 individuals uh, to implement the discovery reforms, body-worn camera, to work on our diversion courts, uh, 
integrity review unit. Uh, and if we don't receive that full funding that we were promised, uh, we will be in a world of hurt, as will the criminal justice system in the city of New York. Um, and so I just want to make that very, very clear that everyone should come away from uh, this hearing that although the, it looks like the city of New York will receive a lot of relief from the federal government, and uh, that's a good thing, if this situation or condition is not corrected, we are going to basically have to shut down a lot of what's going on uh, in uh, areas that we don't want it. Uh, I know that. Oh. So um, like my colleagues, I'm also pressed for space. Uh, in the last six years, the size of our staff has doubled uh, and we are in the same space that we inherited when I came into office. Uh, we have uh, identified space with DCAS and we are looking for funding to pay uh, that rent. Um, you mentioned in your opening statement, uh, Madam Chairwoman, about the Conviction Integrity Review Unit that was funded here in Staten Island by the City Council. It was never baseline. That money was removed last year. And so now we are uh, working and, and providing that service without um, the funding, although we were sort of uh, robbing Peter to pay Paul, if you will, and because of attrition and changes because of COVID, we've been able to do it, but going forward, we will not be able to, so we're asking the council to provide that. Um, and uh, as part of the funding that we received uh, pursuant to the criminal justice uh, reform money, we also received money that was to help us with things like um, software uh, purchase and maintenance, computers, uh, um, the technology that we needed to do that work. Uh, but unfortunately, for some reason, the administration put that money into capital uh, and we were promised that it would be moved to OTPS. It has not been moved to OTPS and so we can't access that money. Uh, so again, that's a, an irregularity that exists the way things were done uh, about two years ago uh, and we can't go forward without that. Um, Eric mentioned Project Reset. We, uh, the council provided that funding. As you know, we had CCI out here. For the first time, we had uh, pre arraignment diversion for a whole basket of, of low-level crimes uh, in Staten Island, and the program was up and running. We had a dozen of successful cases, and we then lost that money, and we can no longer provide uh, that. Uh, and then lastly, one thing very specific to Staten Island, um, as part of the reductions in the stop VAWA funding that came from Washington, I guess that went to Albany, um, the, uh, our SAFE program, which is our forensic uh, sexual assault uh, forensic examiner, we have one on Staten Island, um, and that got cut. We do not have a public uh, health hospital on Staten Island, uh, and so RUMC, the Richmond University Medical Center, had provided that one specialized uh, a nurse who could do the examination uh, and that money was cut and we are threatened with losing uh, our one uh, safe uh, program here on Staten Island, which it seems to me that in a community of 500,000 people, victims of sexual assault should be able to uh, be provided with the services that we all know are so critical, not only in dealing with the emotional impact that has befallen that victim, uh, but also to allow us to prosecute the case against the offender. So uh, I thank you very much for your patience and your attention, and we'd be glad to take any uh, questions. And as I said, Madam Chairwoman, we look forward to working with you under your leadership of this committee. Thank you. Thank you. We will now turn to Bronx County District Attorney Darcel Clark. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. Thank you to Chair Adrian Adams and the members of the Public Safety Committee for providing me with the opportunity to speak with you today. I want to spend, send a special thank you to all of the members, but in particular to the Bronx Council members, Vanessa Gibson, Fernando Cabrera, and my very own council member for where I live in the 12th Councilmatic District, Kevin Riley. I hope you and your families are all safe and well. Um, before I begin my testimony, I wanna take time to pay, uh, pay recognition and gratitude to our colleague, Cyrus Vance. Cy, thank you for your leadership and your friendship as we tackle the complicated issues of criminal justice. 
You provided resources not only for your office, but for all stakeholders in the criminal justice system, which led to the advancement of procedural justice and fairness for so many. For that and for so much more, I simply say thank you for your partnership. I last appeared virtually before the city council last May when we were in the throes of the pandemic. We are beginning to emerge from a year of unprecedented challenges. Thank God increased access to vaccine is bringing a new sense of hope. I am especially thankful that the vaccine is now available to my staff who work tirelessly even through the toughest darkest and most frightening moments of the pandemic. Each day they showed up virtually and in person and worked late into the day and night and early mornings to keep my commitment to the citizens of the Bronx. I couldn't be prouder of them and their work. Jury trials are starting up in the courthouses actually today providing the clearest signal that the criminal justice system is moving forward. People once again will get the procedural justice our community deserves. But our renewed hope stands in the shadow of the surge in gun violence. The rise in shooting started last June. It did not abate through the fall, the winter, or even now as we head into spring. You've all been provided with a map. I wanted to share it, but that wasn't possible, but you've all received a map. And on that map, those blue dots on the map show the non-fatal shootings in 2020, and the red dots are the fatal shootings in 2020. Each of those in total are 467 dots, and each of those dots is a life. These are four, 167 people who were shot, 60 of them died by gunfire out of a total of 111 homicides that happened in the Bronx last year. And each of these dots represents an untold number of family, friends, and community members who all suffer the repercussions from gun violence. In response, we immediately stepped up our communication and prioritized our work with NYPD's Gun Violence Suppression Division and the Firearms Investigation Unit. In June, we commenced a comprehensive investigation into one group driving the shootings. So far, we have charged about a dozen members of this group with two fatal shootings and eight non-fatal non shootings and recovered five loaded firearms. An investigation last fall has netted evidence connecting more than 20 people to recent shootings. We are redoubling our efforts to stem the tide of guns coming into the Bronx. We know gun traffickers are bringing them up the iron pipeline from Georgia and other states. Another frightening development is the recovery of ghost guns. Last fall, we executed a search warrant that found six AR-15 style assault rifles that have been built from components that were ordered online. The assembled weapons have no origin and are difficult to trace once they are assembled. As part of community outreach, we held anti-gun violence marches in June and August, a re-entry resource fair in October geared toward violence prevention. We partnered with Cure Violence Groups, many of which are funded by the council, and we want to see that continue. We held a gun buyback in the community with the NYPD in October and took in 136 guns, the largest seizure in one day of all the recent gun buybacks. And now we have more than 1,100 open gun cases. So far this year, there has been 3,350 felony arrests in the Bronx. The increase in felonies add to our existing backlog caused by the pandemic. There are more than 2,500 indicted cases awaiting trial and 2,900 unindicted cases awaiting an available grand jury. Social unrest is real. Our communities are questioning whether the government works at all. Folks are losing confidence that we can do even the most basic function, 
which is keep people safe. To address the urgency of violence, I have formed a multidisciplinary task force within the office, which includes staff from various bureaus bringing in expertise in gang prosecutions, firearms trafficking investigation, homicides, trials, and data analysis from the crime strategy staff. But I'm also developing a long range violence reduction plan to attack the scourge at every angle. It will include smart prosecution, crime prevention measures, and a path to sec successful re-entry. We want to continue all the efforts of our Alternatives to Incarceration Bureau, um, the OR program, the Overdose Avoidance and Recovery Program, Bronx Hope, uh, Another Chance, which are the Warrant Forgiveness Programs, and all of those progressive things that we've brought to the community in order to make the uh, system more safe and fair. Of course, we need resources to carry out this plan and I'm asking for your support to provide them. We need technology and personnel to analyze data to identify the drivers of crime, enhance cases, conduct proactive investigations, develop crime prevention strategies that must include programming for our youth, maximizing resources for alternatives to incarceration for those individuals who are who are ancillary to the violence and community outreach to empower and engage our communities in this effort thanks to the funding by the council which which will last through the spring of next year we need to continue community justice circles of project reset which provides restorative justice and provides an opportunity for the community to resolve crime without police involvement. We need to expand educational programs that engage middle and high schoolers. We need to focus on providing community centers for areas of the Bronx that are in dire need of resources from food insecurity to mental health resources. We provided a Saturday Night Lights program that was opening um, gyms in the Bronx on Saturday nights. And this program in September 2019 worked very well until COVID forced closing of the soccer fields and basketball courts. We plan to deploy our Bronx DA detective investigators and ADAs to investigate non-fatal shootings and other violent crimes. Our DIs can gather additional evidence in cases where victims and witnesses are not cooperative, as well as to provide witness security for those who are courageous enough to come forward. We must solve these non-fatal shootings and hold someone accountable to allow the community residents to be safe. We need to hire experienced prosecutors to handle these violent felonies. And most importantly, we need to uphold our obligation to fulfill criminal justice reform. In 2019, the city council recognized our fundamental challenges to meet the demands of criminal justice reform and supported a significant funding increase. The Office of Management and Budget um, Justice Task Force recommended 7.9 million for criminal justice reform personnel needs as well as substantial capital funding for technology improvements. However, only 4.6 million was provided of that 7.9 million originally recommended for fiscal year um, 20. Then the global pandemic shifted the priorities of the city and the balance of the 7.9 million was never allocated. We could, we could only hire 70 of the 122 positions that were required. And we only received seven months of funding allocated out of that original criminal justice budget to pay for them. As a result, I am here to request the balance of the money that was promised to us last May. That is the $3.2 uh, million. As we hyper-focus on violence, we must meet our expanding discovery obligations in a shorter amount of time while focusing on an unsustainable backlog. A case management system is desperately needed to improve my office's case tracking abilities and data analysis. My colleague Cy Vance just launched a 
incredible data dashboard that provides the public with comprehensive data about the Manhattan DA's office's prosecution. It includes more than seven years worth of data from arrest to sentencing and allows users to narrow results by race, gender, and age, and among other filters. This is something that every DA's office should have, especially as you, the city council, and the public in general are requiring transparency in the criminal justice system. In addition, a document management system is critically needed to streamline and manage hundreds of thousands of templates and documents across the office. At minimum, we need a discovery sharing tool that will assist ADAs in disseminating discovery to our defense partners. The Microsoft OneDrive was not intended to support this large amount of file sharing. A tool is needed to integrate our case management system, manage discovery, and provide redactions. Especially with the significant backlog of cases, a tool is required to assist in these efforts. I created a discovery compliance bureau. It will maintain the office's databases of law enforcement accountability materials and assume responsibility for broader discovery compliance issues to ensure we meet criminal justice reforms obligations. The burden of the case backlog created by COVID pause has made this bureau essential to the ability to remain transparent in our prosecutions. It is all part of police accountability, enhancing transparency in our investigations and strengthening the public trust in the criminal justice system. Most notably, the repeal of New York Civil Rights Law Section 50A, we have expanded our efforts to collect and review the massive amount of data now available to us relating to complaints against officers and disciplinary matters. Aside from high tech, we need something very basic, cell phones. With staff working remotely um, for the last year, cell phones became more important than ever. Much of the work we do requires our staff to communicate with witnesses, law enforcement, lawyers, and the courts. They call and send text messages and emails. In today's world, much of the communication is not happening from a landline. We cannot expect, and it is not appropriate for our staff to use their own personal cell phones to conduct office business. I am concerned about the Hillary Clinton effect, and that is mixing personal and official emails and texts. With the increased demand for transparency, these communications are discoverable and they should be done with office and not personal equipment. It would cost uh, $584,000 to purchase cell phone service annually for all 500 of my ADAs and 250 of our professional staff. I ask that you provide the funding for these phones. This is a demand that we must me. In conclusion, I humbly request that you provide the necessary financial support for our plan to reduce violence that is plaguing my beloved Bronx, to meet our resource need to address discovery obligations and the insurmountable backlog created by COVID. It is urgent that we do everything we can to protect the safety of our residents, and I cannot let the people down. Thank you again for your consideration. Thank you very much. Uh, we will now turn to New York County District Attorney Cy Vance. Good afternoon, Chair Adams and members of the Public Safety uh, Committee. Thank you for inviting me and my colleagues to speak today about our office's fiscal year 2020 preliminary budgets. Uh, Chair Adams, thank you for your gracious comments at the beginning uh, of the hearing. And I also wanna thank my colleague from the Bronx, Darcel Clark, uh, for her kind comments. The opportunity to work with Darcel and my other colleague DAs has been one of the most uh, satisfying parts of my professional life. And 
having been the district attorney of this county for 11 years now uh, has been a great privilege. Turning to our budget issues, council members, the critical support we receive each year from you and the mayor's office has helped us implement a wide range of criminal justice reforms over the years. Among the most important in the 21st century is for us to be able to be competent in cyberspace and investigations and to become digital innovators. This is a trend in prosecution that is only going to get more important in the years ahead. I viewed my job uh, when I came to district attorney's office, the DA's office in Manhattan, uh, among other things, was to help turn one of the finest 20th century prosecutor's offices into one of the finest 21st century prosecutor's office. And in 2012, the city council was very helpful to us in funding uh, portions of our expenses to create what is now a world-class cyber lab, which we use uh, to help interrogate devices that makes us able to do work we simply would not be able to do otherwise. But also, uh, as Darcel Clark mentioned, it's enabled us also uh, become, because we have the capacity to innovate digitally, uh, to introduce, as she said, uh, concepts like data dashboards on our website available to the public. As Darcel said, for the first time, key metrics about our prosecutions, along with the demographic characteristics, characteristics of those who are coming into the justice system will be available to the public. For several years now, our office has been working on compiling this data and we were proud to finally be able to reduce it, or excuse me, to release it last week. I share what I believe is this council's goal of increasing transparency and accountability among law enforcement. This past year, more than any other in recent memory, has shined a light on the failures of society on social justice, criminal justice, and in combating racism. And COVID-19 has exacerbated inequalities that have always been present, and its effects have been disproportionately felt by communities of color. Late last year, our office released an anti-racism statement which allowed us to the public to memorialize our values and expectations as a district attorney's office and a public agency as we strive in our work to eradicate systemic racism in our criminal justice system. Uh, this statement can be read in full on our, uh, on our organization website, and it was developed in coordination with our office's Equity and Social Justice Advisory Board. And that internal board's contributions are more important than ever following the murder of George Floyd, and as our city faces a rise in hate crimes, particularly those targeting Asian immigrants and Asian Americans. Our office, speaking to this moment we are experiencing, not just in New York, but around the country, analyzes every case involving hate or bias motivated speech or assaults. And those that do meet the legal criteria, which is a strenuous and high criteria, are prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. To combat the rise in bias-motivated crimes, our office's Hate Crimes and Community Partnerships Unit have participated in many forums with the NYPD and community boards, and we are planning a CLE workshop in late April for ADAs throughout the state, and we will be taking part in a forum with our other agencies tomorrow on this very topic. We also have an upcoming meeting with the Mayor's Office to Prevent Hate Crimes to coordinate awareness and prevention. Clearly, these are serious times and it requires a full court press by all of us in public service to work with our communities to address this problem. Another category of crime that we're seeing a troubling rise in are shootings. And my colleagues, the other district attorneys have talked to their own experiences in this regard in their counties. In Manhattan, there have been 41 shooting victims so far this year compared to 232 at this point last year. Overall, 2020 saw an 89% increase in shooting victims. So far this year, there have been 38 documented shooting incidents, which is a 52% rise from this point last year. Now, homicides are relatively stable, 13 to date so far this year. But as we all know, one homicide is a tragedy and a tragedy because it is too many. Now, we saw the sickening confluence of these two crimes crimes committed against Asian people and gun violence in last week's horrific mass shootings in the Atlanta area. 
What do we do as prosecutors to help address some of these nationwide, deeply entrenched issues, gun violence, access to firearms, and, and bias? In 2014, I founded, a co-founded Prosecutors Against Gun Violence, a coalition of nearly 50 prosecutors in 24 states. And I'm very thankful and grateful to the DAs joining me at this hearing for being active members in that organization. Earlier this year, PAGV sent a letter to President Biden and Vice President Harris outlining 30 ways the White House and Congress can make our cities safer. But clearly, we need national leadership both to deal with ending access to guns as well as an end to the inflammatory hate-filled speech that we believe creates an atmosphere in which crimes against Asian Americans and people of Asian descent, as well as, well as other biased crimes, has been permitted to foster. Our leadership in politics has to make sure that ends now. Turning to the focus locally, we have used the court-imposed slowdown related to COVID-19 to assign more of Manhattan's unsolved shootings to lawyers in our office than ever before. And this Sunday, we'll be holding a gun buyback, one of the many gun buybacks that we have um, engaged in in our time here uh, at the Convent Avenue Baptist Church uh, in West Harlem. Uh, I'm, if I said Sunday, I meant to say Saturday, excuse me. New Yorkers who turn in operable handguns and assault rifles will receive a $200 prepaid card. Now there's another alarming trend I wanna draw attention to, which is the rise in subway pushings in Manhattan. This is of great concern and it causes an enormous amount of fear among transportation, among folks taking that public transportation. In Manhattan last year, there were 11 such incidents in spite of dramatically reduced ridership. So far this year, there have been six pushings, putting Manhattan on a pace for between 27 and 28 pushings by the end of this year. In contrast, there were five pushings in 2019 and six in 2018. Now I'm not prepared to offer explanations for this staggering increase, but I do hope that increased ridership on the subways will serve as a deterrent. And I do hope the city and its leaders, as well as the state leaders, will understand the connection between those who may be suffering from mental illness and incidents of crime that occur in our subways. We need to invest in significant ways to help those individuals in our communities who do have a mental illness. And I do believe that is one way we will protect the residents of New York City and its visitors. Earlier, you heard me mention the pandemic's effect on racial disparities. The pandemic has also, as is the case with my colleagues, created havoc in our court system. In New York County, there are approximately 3,500 felony cases awaiting indictment, many of them serious. Now, to address this backlog, we have reviewed every, virtually every nonviolent felony case involving people without significant or recent felony records, which amounts to approximately two-thirds of the backlog. We have made attempts to offer uh, dispositions to those cases, about 700 of them, uh, for months. We were without grand juries, as you know, and for the months after that, we have operated with limited capacity grand juries. To keep this justice system moving forward, we held 298 preliminary hearings during the pandemic. And to put that number in context, we probably handled fewer than a dozen preliminary hearings in the five preceding years. Amidst this backlog, our assistants have been diligently working to meet their electronic discovery burdens. In order to comply with the unprecedented evidentiary demands, we asked that the city fully fund the positions that were only partially funded in the November 2019 budget as been, as been described by my colleagues. Now there are two programs that my office has self-funded with forfeiture proceeds to date, but we will not be able to do so much longer. And they're amazing programs. They are absolutely in line with helping those who need the help the most and focused on prevention of criminal activity. Project Reset and Manhattan Hope. Manhattan Hope was based upon the great program uh, that the Staten Island District Attorney commenced in that county. Now the council has supported Project Reset's expansion to Brooklyn and the Bronx, and we are now seeking support to continue the program in all five boroughs. Let me be clear, having gone to and met with many of the young men and women involved in Pr Project Reset, it is a way and an effective way to reduce young men and women who have become 
criminally justice involved or at risk to turn their lives around without having them become participants in the actual criminal justice process itself, arrest, arraignment, court hearings, and the like. It couldn't be more important to our youth. And I really hope that this council uh, will, as it has in the past, step up and make sure that that program continues to be funded. Our office launched Manhattan Hope in September 2018, and there were 190 people enrolled in Hope in 2019 and 2020, 150 of whom have completed the program and had their cases dismissed or declined to be prosecuted. In addition to potential jail bed savings, Manhattan Hope yields savings in court and police resources. My office requests $625,000 annually to continue this critical program going forward. Council members, up until this point, we've been able to use case generated revenue, revenues generated from our investigations and fines and forfeiture that have been achieved by those investigations to support an innovation. But this is not a stable funding source or a long-term solution for addressing baseline salary needs. Specifically, our office requests an additional $12 million in personal services funding to sustain critical activities that we have been self-funding in this office since 2010, including many of the programs that have been city funded that have been referenced by my colleagues in their testimony. The Conviction Integrity Unit, which we started and funded in, 20, in 2010. Uh, the fine, our investigative unit, uh, which provides has provided to the city of New York since the time I've been in office, $1.2 billion directly back to the city of New York in fines and forfeitures as a result of our financial frauds in units work. Our re-entry work, our work in college and prisons, for example, uh, and uh, many other programs and, and units that are doing great work that we have been self-funding, but in order to have them continue to provide work for the residents of New York County in the future, uh, we need and ask them to be funded by the city going forward. 11 years ago, the people of Manhattan granted me this great opportunity to return to the extraordinary office where I began my legal career. It has been my great privilege to represent the people of New York County in delivering justice, in keeping New Yorkers safe, and leaving behind what I hope is a fairer justice system than the one we inherited. Thank you, council members, for the opportunity to speak today, for your support, for your commitment to public service and to our city. And thank you for the continued support of our office. And thank you. We will now turn to the Special Narcotics Prosecutor, Bridget Brennan. There we go. I think we're good. Thank you very much. As Special Narcotics Prosecutor, I'm grateful to the support for my office and that uh, both my office and the DAs received from the Council's Committee on Public Safety. Thank you to the committee members for your support and your participation today. I've condensed my testimony so as not to repeat the issues that have been already raised by the DAs and are common to all of us. I welcome the leadership and the vision of Chairperson Adrian Adams, and I look forward to working with you and with the members of the committee on our common goals of protecting city residents and assuring that our criminal justice system is fair for all. As an office, we are deeply committed to addressing systemic racism and entrenched inequities, which I will describe later in my testimony how my office is addressing this. The Special Narcotics Prosecutor, or SNP as we are known, works collaboratively with the DAs to investigate and prosecute felony crimes, narcotics crimes in all five boroughs. We handle cases involving sales or possessions of large amount of heroin, fentanyl and cocaine, addictive pills, and related crimes. New York City, <clears throat> excuse me, is unique in a way that led to establishing our office and makes our office as relevant today as it was when it was established. New York is the only major city in the nation which is divided into five separate counties, each with its own district attorney empowered to prosecute crimes committed within the borders of each borough. New York City continues to be a hub of international narcotics importation, the same as it was when our office was formulated about 50 years ago. 
Each drug shipment has a single point of entry through one of the five boroughs, but may be distributed to all five boroughs. SNP was created to address this free flow of narcotics across county lines. The district attorneys appoint the special narcotics prosecutor, assign assistant district attorneys to serve here and oversee all of our wiretap investigations. We were the first to recognize, recognize the surge of prescription pills and later deadly fentanyl being sold in New York City street markets. I will tell you that we are seeing more fentanyl coming in today than ever before. And also that methamphetamine, which is also manufactured in Mexico, is coming in at a far higher value, volume than ever before. And we see it masquerading in many forms as Adderall pills mixed into cocaine, sold as ecstasy, and as in other forms. We also remain vigilant and proactive in responding to the connection between violence and drugs. In recent investigations, we have seized numerous semi-automatic weapons and other firearms. And I urge you to read our case summaries at the end of my written testimony, for example, of the significant impact of our cases. Critically important in our focus is how racial inequity in the criminal justice system has harmed communities of color and what we can do to address it. The nationwide protests in response to the killings of George Floyd and other black people sparked important and difficult conversations about race, justice and policing in our office as they did across the city and the nation. These events have prompted us to intensely re-examine our methods and goals in our own criminal justice community. SMP staff members were deeply affected and we are committed to improving our policies and practices to counter systemic uh, excuse me, inequities in every aspect of our work. And I will discuss how we are doing that later in my testimony. Tragically, as we struggle to end racial inequities and continue to grapple with the COVID-19 pandemic, another deadly health crisis, the opioid epidemic, has dramatically worsened as you have heard from DAs McMahon and Clark. On average in New York City, five people favor fatally overdose every single day. COVID-19 has both overshadowed the opioid crisis and exacerbated it. Preliminary information released by the Department of Health indicates a 26% increase in people dying from drug overdoses in New York City in 2020 compared to the previous year, and that's a record high. The epidemic continues to have a disproportionate impact on high poverty neighborhoods, particularly in the Bronx and Upper Manhattan. And fentanyl is the drug most often identified in overdose deaths. And it is mixed in with heroin and cocaine, sold as prescription pills, and puts anyone purchasing drugs on the black market at risk. We employ a strategic approach to address the opioid epidemic and reduce violent crime, focusing on four major areas, high level narcotics importation and trafficking, drug activity associated with violence, overdose death investigations, and medical professionals who illegally sell prescriptions. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> it always happens in the middle of your testimony. Uh, Thank you. Thanks for your patience. Over the past 20 years, SNP has overseen some of the nation's most successful major narcotics investigations, while at the same time, reducing incarceration and promoting drug treatment and proven harm reduction practices. Page six of my written testimony demonstrates this, and you'll see that the number of people my office has sent to state prison in connection with our cases declined more than 80% between 1995 and 2018. We continue to refine and modernize our mission and we're continuing that even today. I'd like to tell you about how we are approaching criminal justice reform in a way that we can accomplish comprehensive and sustained transformation. To sensitize all in our office to the scope and reality of the problems of racism, we invited legal and non-legal staff to participate in small group discussions led by our chief diversity officer to share personal stories and reflections. 
many talked of experiencing trauma, racism, and our privilege because of their skin color. We subsequently formed a diversion and inclusion committee to explore how we can best respond to systemic racism as an office, but to move beyond mere discussion and identify and change flawed practices, we broke into individual working groups, which examined topics such as legal practices and procedures, education and training, alternatives to incarceration and community outreach. The diversion and inclusion committee presented their recommendations to me. And one major area of planned expansion is for us to develop more programmatic supports for those charged with drug crimes, regardless of whether they are facing incarceration or whether they have substance use issues. Our office is proud to have been in the forefront of developing alternative to incarceration programs 35 years ago. Our programs were aimed at diverting those whose crimes, often street drug sales, were motivated by their own substance use issues. As an alternative to the harsh criminal penalty of the times, we offered placement and treatment programs which help people recover from substance abuse and develop life skills. But much has changed since we launched our pioneering uh, treatment programs, and I fear our office has fallen behind in that area. The New York City District Attorneys have been leaders in developing programs for those whose crimes may be based on issues other than substance use. We are consulting with them and we are expanding criteria for treatment and programmatic eligibility and we are developing new programs suitable to the individuals we prosecute today. I have no specific funding requests for support for this at this time, but we may return to the Council for more funding and an opportunity to explain to you our expansion of diversion. The other diversity and inclusion recommendations that we're following up on include reevaluation of our search warrant practices and revision of our training and manuals. As an agency, we have a strong record of rigorously reviewing requests for search warrants and carefully considering the factual bases for these requests. Because of the care and attention we devote to our search warrant practice, none have resulted in a death or serious injury to an occupant of premises or a law enforcement officer. However, the death of Breonna Taylor during a search warrant execution prompted a thorough review of our protocols, particularly with attention to no-knock warrants. We are also involved in a careful analysis of whether any of our practices regarding permissible pleas unfairly impact co-defendants. And we are discussing among legal supervisors the best and fairest practices in making charging decisions, including how we charge defendants in conspiracy cases. We are also expanding education and community outreach programs. In conclusion, as I said, I won't repeat the information already provided by the DAs, uh, but their requests for additional funding with regard to discovery uh, and the huge backlog of cases we face, we face those same challenges. In addition, as I've told the committee, uh, we are seeing a surge in fentanyl and methamphetamine coming into the city and a record number of overdose deaths. And I urge you to warn your constituents about this, warn them about the dangers of buying any kinds of pills, which may be masquerading as legitimate pharmaceutical products, of buying any of those kinds of pills on the black market. Uh, it could really seriously uh, endanger their lives. And finally, I too thank District Attorney Vance for his dedication to the people. I started uh, in this office uh, shortly before DA Vance started in the Manhattan DA's office. Uh, both of us were Manhattan assistant district attorneys and I have seen him develop his career. He has become my boss. I thank him for his leadership, his vision and for his support and his guidance. And I thank all of you for your attention and I look forward to answering any of your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I will now turn it over to uh, Chair Adams to begin her questioning. Panelists, we are now going to ask all of you to unmute. And as long as we don't get too much feedback, we will try to keep you all unmuted if possible for the duration of the question and answer period. If for any reason you need to mute yourself or we need to mute you, 
please signal to the camera or use the Zoom raise hand function if you would like to answer a question or a question is directed to you um, so that we can unmute you again. A reminder to Chair Adams, you will be in control of muting and unmuting yourself during this period. Thank you, Chair Adams, you may begin. Thank you very much, Council Members Deutsch, Gibson, Miller, Powers, Menchaca, and Cabrera. Uh, thank you all so much for your testimony uh, thus far. I really, really appreciate it. And again, it's wonderful hearing you and uh, seeing you. Hi, Camille. Uh, wonderful seeing you on this <laughs> on this Zoom platform as well. Just a note um, before I, I start my questioning, a couple of you mentioned uh, funding for the criminal justice reform. So I just want to note, just to make it clear uh, to everyone that's listening uh, to this hearing, that the administration is responsible for funding the budget on uh, criminal justice reform, not the council. So I just wanted to make that clear. Um, and I also just wanted to um, just, just ask this question before I get into um, the nuts and bolts of the budget questioning. Um, you know, every year the DAs come before, and I've uh, been, you know, uh, in these meetings since I've been elected uh, the past three years. Every year I notice that the DAs do come before the council with lists of requests, which this year is completely different. The requests are certainly valid. Um, but every year it seems that the council is asking the DAs for metrics about your caseloads uh, and uh, intake resources, the resources that you need uh, for your cases to better understand your cases. But it's my understanding that council doesn't necessarily receive that information. So I'm just going to ask all of you to please commit uh, to producing that data for the council this time around. Of course. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, DA Katz, I'm going to start with you, and then I think I'm going to get a little bit more generic because um, you, our testimony as the newest DA, uh, and we know that you came in with a tremendous vision for Queens and for the office. Um, so uh, since taking office in 2020, you've created several new bureaus and units, including some that you mentioned, a conviction integrity unit, a housing worker protection unit, a community partnership division, and a cold case unit, among others. During the fiscal year 2021 executive budget hearings, your, ask, your office asked for $4.8 million to support the operation of these new units. Is this figure still accurate? Well, well, we actually could use 11 million more. Oh. Uh, <laughs> You know, look, at the end of the day, you do what you need to do in order to get the job done. And uh, Councilwoman, uh, Madam Chair, I'd also like to point out, you know, you asked for some numbers, and I think that's a really fair and important question. You know, our, our um, caseload in the last you know, year, even despite COVID, uh, we were able to dispose of 18,000 uh, cases. Uh, in 2020, we responded to 200 homicides, 100 responses to sexual assault on site we were able to produce 917,693 documents to defendants, including 41,934 videos, all of which need to be gone through as you turn them over for evidence. And there's many more numbers uh, that we can give you. Intake was 28,000 cases uh, with 21,000 arraignments. And I say this to put this in context, uh, Madam Chairwoman, you know, Madam Chair, you know, we have all of the everyday issues that keep happening, intake, arraignment, investigations, uh, you know, our prosecutions, uh, all that comes with running a 750 person office. Uh, but at the same time, and I wanna put this in context, as a brand new DA, I've developed these additional bureaus um, of, you know, the CIU, the Bureau of Housing Worker Protection, cold case, restorative and rehabilitative justice, um, you know, a far Rockaway Justice Court that we're trying to work with. Um, and so we've added all of those bureaus, a community engagement, which is almost at every meeting in the community now, we have a representative. Uh, and not to mention the CIU, which, you know, has already vacated seven convictions. Uh, and so with all of the additions, we've gotten the same amount of money as last year, uh, which was 70, you know, 75 million, which by the way, uh, is $28 a constituent. Um, and so if you put it just in context, 
it is the lowest amount of money. Uh, and for a new DA to start all the bureaus and because my, my colleagues are doing great work with their funding as well. And this is not about uh, you know that, this is about the fact that as a new DA, I had to form all of these new bureaus, all of these new divisions, all of these new policies and programs, which were brand new from January 1st. And by the way, hire new executive staff, a lot of new individuals to run our bureaus. Um, but a lot of the programs and policies were not in effect in 2019, only 2020. Um, and so the 4.8 million was criminal justice reform that we got last year. Uh, we've used 4.8, uh, we got a few hundred thousand dollars more of that, I, I, that's already gone. <laughs> um, so that's what we're asking for, which is the 11 million, which will cover a lot of our new programs. It'll cover the Violent Criminal Enterprise Bureau to get the guns off the street, strategies units to make sure that we are doing it right from the very beginning, community partnerships, criminal uh, conviction integrity. By the way, elder fraud, which we really haven't focused on, which I will tell you the scams out there, we're working every day to make sure that our seniors are safe uh, from so many of the uh, individuals that are trying to take their money in the worst of times. Yeah. Um, but in addition, making sure that our young people aren't ending up in the system, right? Best criminal justice is when they never end up in front of any of the DAs that are on the Zoom. Um, and so, yes, uh, we are in need for that. I appreciate the question. Thank you, DA Kat. You actually, you actually answered several of my questions within the one question. So- um, I tried. <laughs> I knew you would. So thank you, thank you, thank you for that. Um, let, let's let's take a, a, a bigger look at the picture on state criminal justice reform. So um, the November 2019 plan added baseline funding of approximately uh, $35.8 million, including $25.7 million in PS and $10.2 million in LTPS to support a total of 729 new positions across all of your offices related to discovery and bail reform. Funding added in the November plan was prorated to reflect what was needed for the remainder of the year. However, OMB included the prorated amount in the baseline budget and not in the full fiscal year value. We haven't spoken, or, or at least I haven't heard a lot of uh, mention of OMB in, in, uh, in testimony um, this afternoon. So uh, this question is really for, for all of you and anyone who, that wants to jump out there and just let us know, what conversations have your offices had with OMB about this? If, if I may, Madam Chairwoman, uh, I can yes, assure sir. you that our office has talked uh, uh, consistently and throughout the time period uh, with OMB and with the administration uh, and with your team at the council. Uh, and certainly we, 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 we understand the budget processes, but uh, are asking for your help in advocating for uh, the full baselining of this of these funds. Uh, because we, we, we all agree that we should be following the, 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 state, the letter of the state law, criminal justice reform, but also the spirit of it. Uh, and we want to be more transparent. We, we want to provide those materials. Uh, but as you saw in, in, the, in the penultimate budget, it was, it was seen that uh, we needed that extra personnel. Uh, or, you know, we went through very long conversations with OMB, with the administration, with the council. Mock J in particular, uh, to establish what was needed. All of the offices did that, and we came up with a formula, which we thought that if we implemented it, we could meet the goals and the rightful goals of the criminal justice reform. For some reason, and and you know we've we've all been in different ways involved with city government for many years. I don't know why they only funded uh, sixty percent of what they were supposed to fund. Uh, the money was there at the time. We were promised by OMB that the money would be restored in the November plan of, I'm getting my uh, 19 and November plan of 20, um, and it wasn't done. So um, we are, we need your help uh, in advocating with the administration and with OMB uh, to get that money in there. Otherwise we will be uh, facing layoffs. Uh, and in my office, we were able to 
uh, efficiently hire most of those people. Uh, so we now are facing a budget shortfall of over a million and a half dollars, which for me is, is considerable, for our office is considerable, but you know, prorate that to my colleagues, it's the same. Uh, and uh, we will we'll be in a deep hole uh, and we will not be able to perform our mandate and we will not be able to keep the personnel uh, who, you know, we work very hard in this city not to lay people off throughout COVID uh, and the economic fallout from it and to now be able to, now because we can't get this done. So we understand, you know, and thanks for explaining that process to it, but we, we would definitely need your advocacy uh, as you go into the budget and the budget negotiations team. Thank you, D.A. McMahon. And I have to just say uh, your testimony was most compelling. Um, and I was going to ask the question, but you answered the question regarding uh, the funding for uh, Violence Against Women's Act or the VAWA Act, and that has been taken away from your office, which is extremely disturbing. Um, and um, it, extremely disturbing. So we're going to take a closer look at that as well. Um, that's funding in particular, that and the opioid prevention programming also particularly disturbing, um, the losses there. So I wanted to mention that also. Um, yeah. For uh, DA Vance, and, and, and your office received one-time funding of $625,000 in fiscal year 2021. Um, I think I know the answer to this, but for the record, we're talking about the, the opioid prevention programming and uh, Project Hope and and and, uh, and and other programming has OMB committed to baselining these funds beginning in FY22. Madam Chair, no, they have not. Uh, and as as I mentioned earlier, these funds relate to Project Hope uh, in particular, which started in the great county of Staten Island, uh, but is so you know so worthy a program to have in all our counties. It's it's just it's important. Uh, and it works. Along those, those same lines, um, can all of you share uh, with us how participation has been affected by COVID-19 and how your offices are working with DOHMH and MOCJ to keep people engaged? I'm sorry, Madam Chair, I, I, I didn't hear, didn't, you. Didn't hear uh, your I'm question sorry. clearly. I'm sorry, it's probably because my dog was barking back there. Um, <laughs> uh, the, question, the question was, uh, can all of you share with us how participation has been affected by COVID-19 and how your offices are working with DOHMH and Mach J to keep people engaged in spite of it? <clears throat> well, I mean, I'll start if, you, if you'd like. I mean, we have a call once a week with Mach J we go through everything that is new that is coming down the pike. We go through all of our stats. We go through exactly uh, what our districts need, where OCA is vis-a-vis uh, -vis the executive orders. Uh, and we, when um, the health department is needed, it comes on the call as well. But we're in constant contact during COVID. We all had to be. We all had to know exactly the direction our offices go. I mean, at least, look, in, in our case, um, you know, we took care of an incredible uh, backlog uh, when it came uh, to COVID and during the, the pandemic. Um, but you had to be in constant contact. Um, like I said before, I mean, even during the pandemic, I mean, you got to look at what, what happened. In, in last year, in April, I think it was three right. to 400 no, uh, cases. But she's not that, answering. Uh, I think it was like 21 cases uh, that we had. Um, like I'm hearing background. I apologize. Uh, hello. I'm sorry. Oh, I? oh, I mean, if you, yeah, you're on. Sorry, Darcel. Oh, so I, I'm okay. I'm sorry. I didn't know if you finished. No, I'll give you an example of, of something from COVID. Right? So in February, 3,000 cases uh, were resolved. So last month in our office, because of COVID and because of everything that was in the system, 3,000 of our cases were resolved. In April of last year, only 200 cases were resolved. So the speed in which we've had to work uh, and, and the conditions in which we've had to work under COVID needed the other agencies input. And I think MOCJ has done a good job in coordinating the different agencies uh, as we went through this last year. And DA Clark, I believe you wanted to follow up. I, I'm getting so confused as whether I'm unmuted or not or whatever. Um, I think the way that I wanna answer that is that COVID, you know, the pause 
and COVID had a tremendous impact on our engagement with those people who are justice um, involved. The, you know, the, although the number of arrests went down, the backlog is still building up an inventory that we still have to get through. One of the things that would have been that we were able to do when the courts were fully operational is that our alternatives to incarceration um, programs, we were able to do that. The Bronx Hope and OR and you know all of those programs like that, we were able to do it, but you need the court open. What we had to do is even switch those programs virtually and we had to wait until the city can help those community-based organization help. Mark J was able to help us with, for example, we use um, Bronx Community Solutions, which is part of the Center of Court um, Innovation that runs a lot of our diversion programs. So we had to wait for them to provide access to the community so that they could still engage in the programs, even virtually, because the offices were actually closed. So it took time to start developing that, but we were able to do it. The other thing is now with the with the executive orders and everything else, these a lot of these cases are the misdemeanors. Now they're done by the desk appearance tickets. And those dates are pushed out much further than what was originally planned in the criminal justice reform. Before it was 20 days that we had to start processing them. Because of COVID, they've been pushed out 120 days, I think now they're 90 days, and we're back to having thousands and thousands of misdemeanors, you know, piling up before we can even review them in order to see if they're viable in order to offer any type of alternatives to incarceration. So we have to basically wait until the cases are almost calendared in order to put all of that into effect. So we had to recreate the way we were able to do it, try to get through the DATs sooner, but it's impossible because there are so many cases now. But at least things are starting to open up. Thank God for the vaccine. Center for Court Innovation is now reopening. Um, you know, they, they, they figure out a virtual um, solution, but now the in-person solutions are also happening. But it's still a matter of us getting through all of the backlog of the cases to see which ones are viable or not. And that causes a disconnect because the urgency and the immediacy of a uh, person use disorder person being connected to those services right when they are arrested has been taken away. So now we're losing the fact that people are able to be connected to the services that they need. So, you know, again, we had to, you know, think outside the box to figure out ways for us to get them those resources sooner now that COVID has pushed everything out further. Madam Chair, uh, yeah, in Manhattan, in Manhattan, uh, in Manhattan uh, we've experienced exactly what you've heard from the other counties. But I, I, wanted, I also want to say that our, our, our working with OCA and, uh, and the Department of Health, I think that working relationship has been excellent in terms of helping us work with the with OCA and, and the representatives uh, in the weekly call that DA Katz described. Uh, it, it's been a very close connected relationship and particularly during the time when we were trying, we were very focused on reducing the Rikers Island population. Uh, and we were having multiple calls a day uh, between those three agencies and others uh, trying to make progress, which I believe that we did make at the time. I know. We, 45% reduction uh, of population in Rikers Island. Uh, and that was, that was really a collaborative uh, work between the agencies you described. And uh, so far, I think it's worked, uh, it's, it, it's worked you know, as well as it could work in an, in an absolute crisis for which we were at the time completely unprepared. Dear Vance, I, I'm just going to just hop on, hop on that. Um, you shared with, with us a lot in your opening testimony. And can you share with the committee what your final goals are for your office and what you hope to accomplish before you depart? Before I depart, I, I, I don't want to look backwards or, or I might go on too long. But you know, I have some major investigations uh, uh, which need to... Uh, uh, to have my full attention over the next nine to 10 months. Yeah. Uh, and 
there are so many things that go on in the Manhattan DA's office from large scale uh, financial fraud investigations to cyber to I know, all the range. So I, I, I still need with the help of Mitt Savor, who's now my new chief assistant uh, to, you know, to manage the office responsibly uh, in these next months and to, uh, and to have the assistance and, and my law enforcement partners and my government partners uh, know that I am fully engaged uh, in this, you know, fully engaged daily uh, uh, until the end of this year. Uh, but among the most important functions I think I can perform is around helping to return our operations in the office from COVID-19 back into something that hopefully is, a, is, something, uh, is something like normal. I, I must say that uh, all of us um, were overtaken at the beginning by the dislocation caused by COVID-19, uh, but also we're also overtaken internally um, by the, you know, the emotions and the uh, and the realization that our criminal justice system uh, needed serious help in restoring the confidence of the public uh, in its operations to be a fair and unbiased system. George Floyd's death last summer, on combined with the combined with the COVID uh, situation has put all our offices and I think all agencies in real strain. And we, my aim, uh, Madam Chair, is to come out of this year with the office in better shape uh, than it was in 20, even when we ended 2019, when I thought we were doing well. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm gonna probably come back for another round. I'm gonna let my colleagues get in here. I know that I see uh, several hands up, so I'm gonna Go ahead and ask uh, council to um, to get the questions from my colleagues. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, again, to all the council members, please use the Zoom raise hand function if you'd like to ask a question. We have a few lined up. We will begin with council member Rodriguez, followed by council member Rosenthal and council member Miller. Time starts now. Thank you. First of all, thank you to thank you to everyone. I know that it's very challenging to all of you, you know, to do the work in a city where, you know, one thing is the role that we play as legislator. The other one is the work that, you know, the men and women do the NYPD, and you guys have to you know, made those cases. And I know that it's difficult. And I think that at the end of the day, you know, what we hope is that we can take our city when it came to a legal system to be in a better place. You know, we cannot drink the Kool-Aid and think that we have fixed everything. I feel that, you know, we are still living in a, in a two system when it comes to the opportunity to someone that is a black and Latino and those are the resources to have a tax law firm to represent them and to be able to have a say or fair share, you know, when they go through the, through the system. But, you know, I know that all of you guys have a big heart and you try to do the best you can. And, you know, I have a question to, you know, to a Brooklyn DA, Eric Gonzalez. And again, I'm more than happy to follow up with you and, and, and your team. And this is about cases related to people that they had said that they have made a case as being doing times in jail, even though supposedly based on information that, that some of them have shared, even proven that they've been serving time for crime that they did not commit. So in this particular case, I know that I've been you know, approached by someone that said that he had 30 years for something that he was charged in Brooklyn. And he started, you know, conversation with the former DA Thompson, but he, they've been trying to continue conversation to see how they can get meetings and present the details about a particular case. Again, that I'm more than happy to follow with you team to see if we can get some time in your schedule. So what their lawyers and they even have someone from the FBI or the agency that based on what they share with me, they're ready to come and present why the person is innocent 
for the crime that he had not committed and he'd been doing 30 years in jail. So how can we move those type of process? You know, why we saw a lot of action in the previous days and why we have not seen more activities going on related to identify cases of innocent people doing times in jail. So I, I welcome the uh, lawyer to call the office and schedule a conversation with our nationally recognized conviction review unit. It's uh, among the, the finest in the country. We've exonerated in the last six years, 29 people. I've exonerated 12 people since I've been the DA. And I look uh, forward to having the conversations uh, regarding uh, you know, the process by which we look at these cases. Uh, but I, I welcome the case. If you wanna give me the name of the case, we'll reach out to the attorney. Yeah, I will, I will pass it. And again, all I have is a lot of good things to say. I know that you guys were very helpful when we were dealing with the hit and run. Uh, but I, I, and so I know that not only you, but all of you guys, you know, want to do the best you can in these type of cases. So I, I, we will follow, you know, to be sure that we connect with their lawyer. I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not pretending to say that anyone is innocent, but at least to be sure that we have the opportunity to connect those cases with you. But I know that, you know, I will follow with, with your team. The other question is uh, to the Manhattan DA, Cy Vance. Cy, first of all, good luck in whatever you will do in your future. I know that even though life is not perfect when it comes to things that we did in Manhattan, we also have the support with a lot of things, including to open the satellite office. How in the time that you have left, can you continue working to, to connect more local youth group with the resources that you'll be able to uh, reinvest in our community? But the one that we brought to Northern Manhattan has been only given to Columbia, New York private studio. So is there any chance to also connect all the local group to the resources that the DAs in Manhattan is able to provide to them? Uh, good afternoon, council member. It's nice, it's nice to see you. Um, the, uh, you know, I, I think our Thanks, office is, I think our office, am I on folks or am I? Yes. Okay, sorry. Uh, council member, our office has had, I think, a enormously robust outreach to young men and women throughout Manhattan uh, since 2010. We started with one gym in Northern Manhattan, which we opened in our Saturday Night, Light, Saturday Night Lights program because it was closed on Friday and Saturdays, providing programming for young men and women back in 2010. It's now 20 gyms uh, around, the, around the city, but during COVID, that program <laughs> to have been remote and therefore not as robust as it would have. We've also, I think, as the council member knows, uh, through our criminal justice investment initiative, opened five as, as part of a $250 million investment in, in our local communities, grassroots, 50 not-for-profits, many in northern Manhattan, uh, in, in an effort to support outreach uh, to young men and women and their families, uh, uh, as well as citizens returning from, uh, from state prison to their communities, as well as helping uh, special victims, particularly vulnerable victims. So I think, a council member, in my remaining time, we are going to, uh, as we hopefully open up uh, these programs again for in-person uh, in, in outreach, be able to be uh, as, as visible as we were before, as before COVID-19 started. I, I, more, I definitely think that it, there's much more that can be done. I have a lot of respect for the institution and your private studying, but when I saw that mo all the money is given to them and for them to distribute, I have issue when there's a, a other local small non-for-profit that they struggle to survive, but they connect you know, the youth, we have a lot of program that they do in the community. But again, nothing is perfect as, as I, I understand it, but I hope that again, as resources are reinvested in the community, I hope that the smallest non-for-profit also gets some of those resources. Well, and, I and my, last, my, my last piece uh, to, uh, again, a concern 
and at the same time, and at the same time, uh, uh, to the Manhattan DA also, we in Northern Manhattan also are going to be following the you, you, with your local team. We need help. There was a case of a young lady being a victim of domestic violence by a person that had more than 30 arrests uh, in previous arrests, most of them involving fights with, uh, with men and women, the NYPD. 30 arrests, a person, that particular person is starting molesting and hitting that, per that young lady when she was 16, when she was in high school. And, and I know that two weeks ago, he, and that person was put in custody and we've been trying to do the best we can so that, you know, those individuals that have that record and unfortunately, you know, violating any type of protection it should also be, again, like, you know, take it more seriously than, than, what, than what they have been. And again, I'm more than happy to follow with, with your team, but I just hope again that in that case, in many cases, that issue related on domestic violence need to get, you know, a bit tougher. Council member, of course, we will welcome speaking with you about the case you're referring to. I don't know the name of the individuals involved, uh, but uh, you know, when we started our Family Justice Center here in about 2012, uh, I think we made clear our commitment to provide uh, survivors of domestic violence uh, and, and other crimes against special victims is an important part and important priority for the work that we do in our office. You've been a leader in this area. I appreciate your leadership and I will appreciate the opportunity to work with you to address your specific concerns. Uh, and our chief assistant will reach out to your office and make sure the connection is made. Thank you. Thank you to all of you guys. It's a great job, Aiden. Thank you, council member. Next up will be council member Rosenthal followed by council member Miller. Time starts now. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair Adams, for this terrific hearing. And thank you to all the DAs for the work that you do. Um, I'm going to ask the same question of everyone. It has four parts, but if the answer is no, 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 that's totally fine. And in fact, I'd prefer the answer be yes, no, yeah, uh, very short. I'm not looking for explanations, OK? So the question is about um, using trauma-informed questioning in the sex crimes unit and whether or not your ADAs have been trained in trauma-informed questioning. Here are the subparts. Which one do you use? How many hours or days is the training? When was the last time they got trained? And how many ADAs have been trained? In other words, is it everyone in the division or half the division, something like that? Um, happy to start with anyone um, who's on. Um, anyone can just start if you like. I was gonna start with McMahon, but I won't even see him. Uh, oh. Council member. Oh, yes, go ahead. Sure. Um, the answer is yes with regard to FETI training. You do FETI, okay. Uh, and that has been provided initially to the members of our specific sex crimes unit. Uh, it was then expanded to provide to the entire office because we believe that the learning, the, that it was applicable not just to yep. Uh, sex crimes cases, but to other aspects. Uh, when, but in terms of the frequency of those trainings and when the last one was, I don't have the answer. I can get it to you. I think it but was 2018. Um, and uh, thank you. Perfect. Next, DA, um, DA McMahon. Yep. Uh, thank you, Councilman. Yep. So, in her office. Um, Last year, the entire Special Victims Bureau and the most of the Domestic Violence Bureau uh, ADAs were trained with Betty um, and the uh, few of the victim advocates. Um, and I can get you more detail on that. Um, but it's a, a very good question since 
coming into office, you know, we 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 also uh, had to get the, the people in our office uh, trained in that, and 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 that's something that's very important. Uh, and as we all know from reports from the UI and, and from the police department, like I just mentioned, the Special Victims Bureau of, of the uh, of SVS of the police department, we also work with them to make sure that their training is up to speed as well, because we want everybody who deals with the victims of sexual assault to be trained uh, in the forward the last, life. When was the last date that you did the training? I will get that for you. I, I know it was in... Uh, 2020, but I'll get that for you, I believe. I'll get that information for you. I don't have that in front of me, but uh, certainly COVID has made a difficult training, so we'll get that for you. And how many days? And I appreciate your getting that back. Uh, you got it. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. Anyone else? Hello? Yeah. Am I? Oh, hi, it's DA hey. Clark. Uh, good afternoon, Council Member Rosenthal. Um, yes, we absolutely <clears throat> have our um, staff trained. We have done the FETI training as well. It started with our sex crimes ADA. I know domestic violence has also been trained. We have a crime victims assistance unit that they've also been trained. And then we also opened it up to other trial assistants that do the work um, with victims. Um, do we have how many hours or how? So are they, are they trained in multiple trials, not just FETI? So it could be anywhere from 16 hours to two weeks. So we've had not only FETI, but other trainings as well. And it can be anywhere from 16 hours, 16 hours to two weeks, right? two weeks training. And we've, we've had multiple ones. When and was the last ongoing one? Ongoing training. Ongoing training. When was the last, the last one? one was during COVID in July. July of 2020 was the last time. I don't know how many total, I mean, that's a lot of, we have a whole crime victims assistance unit that's made up of advocates, therapists and everything. They were trained. Time expired. Madam Chair, if I could just ask that, um, that DA Gonzalez and DA Katz have a moment to answer the question. Sure, so DA, I'm sorry, uh, Council, I was afraid DA Rosenthal. <laughs> Rosenthal, uh, nice seeing you. Uh, we also use the FETI training. Uh, we it's ongoing training in our office. It's it's our, our specialized units uh, are trained in it, which you know special victims, domestic violence, and our unit that works with uh, children, including our special victims uh, counseling unit. They're all trained. The level of training depends on the bureau with uh, social workers and other people having taken the, the longer course. Um, some of our, you know, our special victims ADAs have taken the two week course and all of our ADAs that are in deal with, you know, special specialized cases like this, at the very least have taken a two day training, which was done through the mayor's office. The last date? Uh, well, the ongoing training has been done throughout the year through CLEs that we do in our office, but the last date that we did a training was probably in 2020. I don't believe that we had one in the last six months. Right, that was for Fetty? Yes, that was the two day I believe the two day training, but that's a limited training. That's only a few hours for the two days. Right. It's not the 16 hour course. And, and how recently did they get the two week FETI? I, I would have to get that answer too. Okay, great. Thank you. And then, um, DA Katz, I saw you were driving. So if you don't have everything, I don't want you to have to multitask. Driving and I have, uh... I, it, it's pickup time for you. All right, hold on. It's pickup time for children too, so I apologize. So we do trauma aware survivor informed training. Uh, all of our uh, ADAs are trained uh, clearly in our SVB Bureau uh, to some extent in our domestic violence. We also do a CLE on it every year. Uh, the last time we did a CLE was, uh, I think it was about four months ago. Uh, we also work with Family Justice Center, which take care of, our, um, you know, works with us on all our victims of child abuse. Uh, and they have their own set of training uh, parameters as well. Um, we formed our own sexual uh, violence, uh, you know, special victims uh, bureau 
it was not its own bureau when I got here. Um, I formed it as a separate bureau. I, I raised uh, a, from the chief, from deputy chief that is there now. Um, and our training is very specific. Uh, and we have uh, many cases that go through there and we work in conjunction with the Family Justice Center. Hey, and you work, do you do the FETI training or some other model? I think we use, we use training awareness survivor informed training. I believe we use FETI, but I have to get back to you on the facts. Okay. The forensic one, I'll get back to you. Yeah. So um, I'm pretty sure, just for everyone, that the FETI training was um, discredited in 2018. And um, there are a couple other ones that I think are more respected right now. Um, one, for example, is called Being Trauma-Informed. So you could just Google Being Trauma-Informed, and, and, and I'd be curious to know what you think about that one. It's, it's longer. Um, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Appreciate you, Chair. Thanks for letting me go over. Council member? Yeah. You, uh, just to update. Uh, we had we have done re most recently trauma informed training by the New York City Alliance Against Sexual Assault in January of this year for the Sex Crimes Unit uh, for the Special Victims Bureau, which is a larger group of, uh, of prosecutors dealing with vulnerable victims, as well as uh, our Witness Aid Services Unit. And how long did that last? And all, uh, sorry, that I can't that I can't tell you at this in, right. at this time. Beth, got it. Thank you. Uh, and, and also as an update, uh, my uh, SVB uh, chief just texted me. We do not use FETI, we formed our own uh, through different uh, experts in training. Um, Great. My, my SVB chair, I apologize, has COVID, he is home uh, answering these questions at the no same worries. time. Tell him thank and you. And Council much. Member Rosenthal, we have also been trained in being trauma informed. We've done that as well. Mm -hmm. Do you know when we did it, O'Dallas? I have to check when we did it, but we have done that one as well. So we've done more than just FETI. And we're in the process of getting certain training and we're up to the last two components so that we'll be also able to train ourselves once we get the uh, enough of the outside training that we, it's a train the trainer type thing so that we can do it in house because a lot of these things are very expensive as well. So in order to train our system, we would like them all to have it but we just can't afford it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and I think Queens or, or I'm sorry, whoever said they were, they had reached out to the Alliance uh, um, DA, yeah. band, that, mm. that could be an approach as well. Right. They do a modified uh, something, something. Mm -hmm. uh, Council member, if I, if I may, yeah. I just got the answer that the last time we did training was in January of, of this year, 2021. We, we had a new class of laterals that were trained in it. In what? The FETI. Okay, and um, January, and how long was the training? Well, we have a person that came to our office yeah. that we hired from uh, the, the mayor's office who does the training. So I think it was an all day training. Uh, these are not people who specialize in special victims, but this is additional training for all of our staff. So that those who are going to our ECAB Bureau would have some background in how these interviews go. You know, again, Chair, I really, I can either give it back to you or make it one more sentence, your call, either way. I'm gonna go ahead and give the leeway Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I appreciate it. Listen, uh, if we want to be successful in convicting uh, the perpetrators, uh, the ADAs have to be trained in trauma-informed questioning. The best ones are six last 16 days. And I know that's a long time. But um, without it, um, you really, it's hard to get the answers you need to prosecute a case. And uh, it's true for the NYPD, which uh, has not done a FETI training since 2018. Um, and obviously it's true for all y'all as well. I appreciate everything you do 
on behalf, on behalf of sexual assault victims. But if we want to succeed, and given that what two, three, six percent of cases actually get, uh, you know, I don't know what getting justice means, but uh, where there's a conviction and prison, um, let's at least, you know, I, I think it's worth the 16 day training. It's a meaningful, it makes a meaningful difference. So I really, I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate all y'all and, and I wanna leave it on that note that I really appreciate all the work you do. I know how hard it is. Um, and thank you Chair Adams for giving me an extra moment. Thank you very much, Councilmember Rosenthal. Uh, we had Councilmember Miller on the list. Uh, Councilmember Miller, would you still like to ask questions? I see your hand is down. Okay, I don't believe we still have Councilmember Miller, so we'll turn it back to the chair. Okay, thank you very much, Council. I think we are ready to go on to uh, public testimony at this time. Thank you very much to all the DAs and the special narcotics prosecutor. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. We will we will now turn to public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our in-person council hearings, we'll be calling on individuals one by one to testify. Each panelist will be given three minutes to speak. Please begin your testimony once the sergeant has called, started the timer. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in the order you raised your hand after the panelist has completed their testimony. Council members, you have a total of five minutes to ask your question and receive an answer from the panelists. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the sergeant at arms will set the timer then give you the go ahead to begin. Please wait for the sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. And please bear with us for one minute. We're gonna queue up the panelists. The first two panelists will be Chris Kwok, followed by Shane Correa. Time starts now. Hi, this is Chris Kwok. Is it my turn? Yes, it is. Okay, great. Chair Adams, it's, it's a pleasure to see you again. Uh, thank you so much uh, for having these hearings. Um, my name is Chris Kwok. I'm a board member with the Asian American Bar Association of New York, and I'm here to speak about uh, the importance of um, funding a anti-Asian hate crimes um, bureau within um, the DA's office across the city. Uh, with a particular focus, I think, on Queens and Brooklyn and Manhattan, where there are large populations of Asian Americans uh, that are experiencing uh, increased waves uh, of violence and harassment. Um, I think back actually to an example back in the 70s, uh, there was a, um, a wave of Chinese gang violence, and the immediate response was to fund the police and also a Asian jade squad. Uh, which was to sort of like, you know, catch Chinese gangs and sort of like, you know, suppress that and to eliminate that danger to the public order. A great deal of resources uh, were put to that. And um, I don't think anyone sort of opposed sort of that elimination of that element uh, within Chinatown and the Asian American community. I look at that as a model because eventually uh, it came and went, it was successful in, in the elimination of uh, Chinese gangs. Um, but now there is sort of a problem slightly in a different direction that there is, you know, sort of anti-Asian harassment and violence. And um, I think there is a need now to put resources as well towards protecting Asian Americans from that. And, and why? I do think that the existing uh, hate crimes bureaus, once again, um, do need resources, both linguistic and cultural in dealing with Asian American populations. In Queens, we have seen uh, a lack of uh, prosecutions for hate crimes, um, you know, when there is evidence to indicate such. And there is a lack of understanding of the Asian American population, uh, starting with the example in Queens, the attack on Flushing, 
which I think many of us saw in video. Uh, the woman pushed to the ground 10 inches uh, on her on a 10 inch scar on her forehead, a disfiguring scar. Uh, that was charged as a misdemeanor, an assault in the third degree, uh, not as a more serious uh, second degree assault. Um, you know, the attacker, uh, you know, recounted exactly what he said to the New York Times a couple of weeks after he was uh, arraigned uh, or arrested and charged. He said, you know, this is not China, you know, this is coronavirus, get away, you know, sort of language that would certainly indicate, um, you know, um, a hate crime, but no, no action from the Queens DA on that front. So I think that there is a great need for resources, attention and understanding. And you know that is why we felt the need to come here today to ask for that idea to begin here, uh, at least for the time in which we have seen increased violence and harassment directed towards Asian Americans. And I want to thank you uh, for your attention, and I appreciate. I'm expired. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next up will be Shane Correa, followed by Tanisha Grant. Time starts now. Hi. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chair Adams and members of the New York City Council. Uh, in the time that I have to discuss with you today some of the center's priorities, I'd like to start with talking about prearrangement diversion, which was a topic mentioned by several of the district attorneys. Currently, city council funds prearrangement diversion in only Bronx of the outer boroughs, where last year in fiscal year 20, it was funded in part by the administration. Uh, unfortunately, due to the pandemic, it was discontinued as of October of last year, and the only boroughs that currently have access to prearrangement diversion which prevents unnecessary bench warrants is the Bronx and Manhattan. In the points of agreement, while prearrangement diversion is mentioned, there is no date as to when it is due to start. And so as one of the providers of this service, uh, we urge the city to help us bring this service back to diverting low level New Yorkers throughout. In thinking of the other end of the spectrum in terms of serious crime, we also thank the council for its support on our Brooklyn Felony Alternatives to Incarceration program. So far in its second year of running, it has helped divert 70 people from jail placement. And we're seeing that there are increased needs that we get to address with them in community as opposed to in Rikers Island. Specifically, 90% of them are flagging for mental health needs. And depending on the borough, 11 to 25% of them are flagging as homeless. Despite these facts, 89% of our clients are in compliance, which means that they can be safely served in community while avoiding their placement in a jail facility. Next, I'd also like to bring Council's attention to the Innovative Criminal Justice Initiative. This is an initiative that was cut in half last year due to the realities posed by the COVID budget epidemic. Because of these hard decisions, we of course focused on our community's immediate needs focusing on housing stability, mental health responses, and domestic violence programming. But due to these cuts, we had to pull back on other programming, such as child trauma support, DWI screenings during a year where traffic safety deaths have reached their highest numbers since the start of Vision Zero, and supplements to gun violence program, which allows us to serve beyond the catchment areas that are provided by the crisis management system. Finally, as we discuss approaching gun violence, I also wanted to bring Council's attention to the component of the Mayor's Action Plan serving NYCHA housing that has some of the most dangerous crime statistics in terms of gun violence and how residents are engaged. Next year in fiscal year 22, so July of the upcoming year, the neighborhood safety initiatives, which connects residents directly with uh, administration officials to meet the needs that are identified by community residents in NYCHA housing, will lose funding in the developments that we help support. And so while focusing on the other aspects of public safety, we would like council to continue to support this means of connecting these communities directly with government officials. Thank you so much for your time and looking forward to working with you over the coming year. Thank you. Next up will be Tanisha Grant, followed by Camille, Khalil Smalling, followed by Tawaki Kamatsu. Time starts now. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes. Hi, my name is Tanisha Grant. I am CEO of Parents Support and Parents New York. And I just wanted to come on here and say um, about public safety. Um, the police have never made me feel safe. If anything, they have criminalized um, the people in our communities. And I'm very, very concerned that um, with the rise in anti-Asian um, 
hate that uh, it will be taken out on the black communities um, and will be a way for the police to um, further um, criminalize black people. Um, I think that is time for us to say the truth and not just talk about the anti-Asian hate, but also talk about the black people in this in this city that have be that have been discriminated against uh, against by the police for a very long time. And I also think that it's very disrespectful to keep saying George Floyd's name, like there wasn't an Eric Garner, like there wasn't an I Carly Garley, like there wasn't a whole bunch of people that are black that in New York that have been totally harmed by the police. So when I think about, when, so when we think about public safety, um, we really have to understand that the people who live in these communities that are overly policed and decriminalized by the police, it does not make us safe. It makes us fear for our lives. It makes me keep my 14-year-old son in the house because he's a Black boy. And um, until you're a Black mother and you have to keep your Black son in the house because you're scared that the police will kill them is a different type of feeling. So I think that we need to be truthful. We need to hold up the truth and we really need to stop um, the harm that has come to our communities under the disguise of community protection. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next up will be Khalil Smalling, followed by Tawaki Kamatsu. Time starts now. Hello. Hi. Um, I'm sorry. Give me one second, bringing up my testimony. Uh, my name is Khalil. I'm a resident of New York State and member of a uh, New York City chapter of Democratic Socialist America. Uh, on May of 2016, uh, I arrived back from my junior year of college. I was a victim of NYPD's excessive predation they call policing. On my way home, we're hanging out with the roommate. My back had broken on the four train and the last leg of my journey, when I overslept on the bus walking home, clutching my bag against me, an unmarked black car, <clears throat> NYPD vehicle rode up on me, stalking me like prey. Um, I didn't know who was in the vehicle. Uh, I was late. Um, and so I, I accelerated, I, I walked faster and the car followed me. It ended up starting a chase uh, where the car weaved in and out trying to catch me, finally knocking me down. And officers came out displaying their badges. My smartphone was broken in, in, in the chase. Um, the reason for their spectacle was because I looked suspicious with my broken bag. Um, I did not feel safe. In fact, the NYPD made me feel less safe. Um, this is why I'm urging the city council to end qualified immunity for police officers and strip Commissioner Shea and his successors of final disciplinary authority. So while the department exists, there is at least some form of accountability, but we also need real safety, not more policing. A budget that represents our city's priorities. It's time we divest from an institution that preys on young black men like myself and invest in our communities. The council should urgently redirect funding for the NYPD into expanding funding for municipal services in this city that actually makes our community stronger and safer. I yield my time. Thank you for your testimony. Next up will be Tawaki Kamatsu. Um, and then if there are any other members of the public whose names have not been called who wish to testify, please use the Zoom raised hand function. Mr. Time starts now. Hi, I'm Tawaki Kumatsu. Um, I previously testified in your hearings. Um, there was another hearing last week that I was illegally prevented from testifying in that was conducted by the Public Safety Committee, mainly because of the fact that Ms. Adams chose to violate the agenda for that hearing. Um, I got some audio recordings from the CCRB on Friday that essentially confirmed that the mayor's head of security illegally kept me out of public meetings in 2017 that benefited uh, the mayor, members of the city council, and other um, government personnel. So I'm going to apprise a federal judge of that um, in the next 48 hours to essentially have the federal judge issue an order that will uh, void the 2017 New York City government ele elections to cause the people who prevailed in those elections to essentially be fired. Um, and I'm also meeting with the prosecutors to have the mayor's uh, NYPD security detail, community affairs unit, and members of the city council prosecuted for violating New York State uh, penal code, all sections of it, as well as applicable federal criminal statutes. Um, I'm gonna be um, submitting written testimony online 
uh, for the benefit of the public. I don't trust Ms. Adams. I don't trust Mr. Adis. I certainly don't trust um, Bronx DA Clark, whose team I kicked the, kicked the butt of um, in a retaliatory frivolous case. Also, I see Sergeant Bradley. He's a defendant in one of my lawsuits. So was, um, what's his name, Manhattan DA. So yeah, um, that testimony, it's gonna be online for the public. So if any of you guys wants to read it, it's gonna be there. If you have any questions, my email address is T-O-W-A-K-I underscore K-O-M-A-T-S-U at yahoo.com. And one last thing, with regards to the press, don't trust them, they're total garbage, just like Ms. Adams and Mr. Adis and Darcel Clark, as well as uh, Sergeant Bradley. Have a good day. Thank you for your testimony. I see also uh, Eric Teen. Uh, looks like you've raised your hand. So um, if you wish to testify, uh, you may go ahead. All right. Thank you very Time much. Time starts now. Thank you very much. Um, so, you know, after cell phone videos recorded the police murdering innocent civilians last summer, we saw our nation rise up in protest and they brought the concept of defunding the police to the mainstream. And this, this question, the role of police on a, you know, for the national conversation, who they protect and who they serve. And it's clear to black and brown people that police do not exist for their safety. Investing in police does not invest in public safety. So we should be spending our tax dollars on services that actually benefit the most oppressed vulnerable people in our city and prevent future crimes, just jobs that provide a living wage, summer jobs for youth, universal Wi-Fi coverage, healthy food, mental health support, and quality education. Just all the basics for you know a quality of life. The police department is supposed to serve all New Yorkers equally, regardless of race, class, religion, sexuality, or gender orientation. And yet for most of their history, they have failed to meet these standards. And one of the reasons for this problem is that there's no accountability. And with our civilian complaint review board, they can make recommendations to discipline officers, but they have no actual power to enforce the decisions. And with the current system, the New York City Police Commissioner can just disregard the recommendations. And so we have the system where police are responsible for policing themselves. And obviously this doesn't work. So I'm calling for the, the Police Commissioner review of the CCRB to be completely removed. And I think until they do this and until the NYPD proves that they have been able to remove all the so-called bad apples from their from their force, their budget should be reallocated to other services. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. I don't see any raised hands from council members or other members of the public. Um, so I will turn it back to the chair for closing remarks. Thank you so much, council. Uh, if there is no further testimony uh, to be had today, I would just like to once again thank all of my colleagues, members of the public, of course, all of the members uh, of the uh, DA's office from across the city of New York, everyone that testified today and submitted written testimony. I'd also like to thank all of our council staff uh, for all of their hard work in uh, putting this this hearing together. This was day two of the budget hearing for the Committee on Public Safety. And if there is no further testimony as stated, this meeting is hereby adjourned. Thank you.